Hey, what's up? How you doing? George Crawford. Today we're going to talk about EGDs and colonoscopy. EGD and colonoscopy, they are the same but different. Today we're going to talk about what one scope is and what one scope isn't. You also kind of have this situation where a lot of people confuse an EGD with and upper GI. So we're kind of talk about the difference between those two. Um, before we start about any of this, the first thing we're going to focus on is the equipment. So the EGD scope and the colonoscope actually are the exact same scope different by two things, the length of the scope and the size of the lumen in the scope, which also affects the outer diameter. Regardless of which one you're using, the controls are still the same which is an up and down right and left dial. There's a suction port and then there's an air water port. The air water port is actually pretty cool because you just put your finger over it and the air goes down the scope out the end. If you push the button in, then water squirts in. There's also an instrument port that allows you to put different types of things like catheters, like retrieval baskets, like biopsy baskets, anything you can down through the scope. At the end of the scope, there are a bunch of different holes and each one has its own purpose. We'll start from this side and kind of go around. Um, air and water port, that's the one we talked about before, so you can irrigate bleeding tissue or you can suck out fluid that's already in the abdomen, stomach or colon. The objective lens is essentially the, the thing that you use to look inside the colon or the stomach. If you have a lens, you also need a light. So there's one superior and there's one inferior. Those are the lights that allow you to see through this lens. This instrument channel outlet is this same port here where you actually put a biopsy or a retrieval basket through and it comes out. And last but not least, you have an auxiliary water that's usually hooked up to a pedal that you can squirt water through. So it's actually a different hole than the air water port because it works on a different system. The first thing that we need to talk about is an upper GI versus an EGD. An upper GI esophago gastro duodenoscope is basically the scope. An upper GI, which is a radiographical test, that's where you drink a lot of fluid and we watch it under x-ray to see it go down in the esophagus into the stomach. You sometimes can add what's called a small bowel follow through. That's where you watch and see the contrast going into the small intestine. So that's an upper GI that's different than the EGD. The EGD basically is like we talked about, a scope that evaluates the esophagus, gastric or stomach, and the duodenum, EGD. The main reason you hear anybody undergo an EGD right now is for GI bleeding. One of the most common causes of GI bleeding is an upper GI bleed from an ulcer. So anytime someone is anemic, which means they've lost blood, usually below a hemoglobin of 10, we know that more than likely it's GI bleeding, so they end up having to get an EGD. Another reason to get one is to look if someone has something wrong with their esophagus. That can be difficulty swallowing, which is dysphagia, or odynophagia, which is painful swallowing. We use this to look and see if someone has an esophageal tumor of esophageal stricture, esophageal narrowing, um, anything wrong with the esophagus. The last part, the duodenum, we use a scope to look down there. Now that's a different issue because the duodenum has a lot of different pathology. So you're looking for cancers, you're looking for stones stuck in the common bile duct. Use a different scope, but a similar scope to look into that duct. The biggest thing about an EGD is the perforation rate. That's the thing you always worry about. Because we're going through the esophagus, the um, stomach, and to a lesser extent the duodenum, the perforation rate is pretty low. That's because both of those are solid structures and the stomach has the ability to give pretty well. So as long as you don't have anything like a cancer or something that fixes the esophagus or fixes the stomach, or it's already a hole in one of them, the perforation rate is pretty low. If you're not using an EGD scope to look for uh, 
bleeding anemia or an esophageal cancer or something like that, or testing to see somebody has reflux, using for screening. Now, assessing versus screening, they sound the same, but they're a little different. Assessing means you're looking at a symptom. Somebody comes in for a problem and you're checking it out. Screening means they don't have any symptoms. You're looking to see if something's wrong. So these are typically things that people have an increased risk for whatever reason, whether it's a family history, whether they've had a previous injury as a child, like they swallowed um, some type of lye or some cleaning product. You would screen those patients every once in a while whether they have symptoms or not. An EGD is a good screening test for looking for stuff like oral pharyngeal cancers. Not so much because it's a good job of looking in the upper airway, but it's good for as you go through, you'll see bleeding, you'll see some changes with that scope. Esophageal cancer, of course, looking at the esophagus, gastric cancer, same thing. Sometimes they're like GIST tumors, GI stromal tumors. Um, sometimes they're lipomas, sometimes they're gastric cancers. Duodenal cancer, which is related to, but is not the same thing as pancreatic cancer, very rare, but can occur. The main way to diagnose this is with an EGD scope, and it also is a good way to screen for it if they're alcoholic, or if they have a history of chronic gastric ulcers or chronic duodenal ulcers, that puts them at risk for duodenal cancer. And of course, in type of inflammatory bowel disease, such as Crohn's disease, it's a good test to look for that. As far as the difference between that's the EGD scope and the colonoscope, the biggest difference, again, is the size, which is 9 to 11, versus the length, which is 100 centimeters. You'll find that the colonoscope is a lot longer, usually at 165 centimeters, and the lumen is a little bigger. It's around 13 millimeters. Now, for this one, we also make a um, pediatric scope. The pediatric scope is essentially, again, the same handles, the same ports, but it's a lot smaller because the pediatric patient is a lot smaller. But other than that, um, the only scope that you would see or hear someone using is a side viewing scope. A side viewing EGD scope is essentially used to look in the sphincter that goes up the common bile duct that separates off the pancreatic duct, the cystic duct, and then the liver duct, um, or the, bile, the hepatic duct. So that would be pretty much the three scopes that you would hear in a general EGD practice. There are a couple other specialty scopes that people use, but for the most part, that's an overview of an EGD scope. Now, with regards to a colonoscope, same beast, a little longer, a little bigger. Again, the controls are the same. Suction, airport, instrument port, lens, two water holes, two light holes, instrument. This scope is bigger because we're pulling out bigger polyps, we're pulling out bigger masses, we have bigger instrumentation, so the lumen needs to be a little bigger. With regards to when we use the colonoscope, similar thing, used to visualize the rectum, the colon, terminal ileum. Again, GI bleeding and anemia, those are the most common things that we assess with a colonoscope. We sometimes use them to look for abdominal pain, but that's usually in the situation where a patient has not had a screening colonoscopy. Okay, pause, look at this, everybody look at me, coming in close, coming in close. A screening colonoscopy is now at the age of 45. Used to be 50, but now it's 45. So if you are 45 years old, this is the time to get your screening colonoscopy. It's been approved by the federal government, which means all payers have to pay for screening colonoscopy at the age of 45. If you get your screening colonoscopy at the age of 45 and you find a polyp, you can get it out and you don't have to talk about having colon surgery or colon cancer. So make sure you understand that the screening for a person in the United States for colon cancer starts at 45, not 50. Okay, back to this. So what we're looking at is screening. Now, one thing to notice is, before we get to screening, is the perforation rate. The perforation rate for a colon is about twice as much as it is for an EGD scope. 
couple of reasons. Number one, the colonoscope is a bigger scope. So you're going to injure stuff more often than you will with a smaller scope. Number two, the colon especially, once you get from the mid-transverse over to the right side is very thin. So anytime you have a thin organ, you run the risk of perforation. So the right colon is perforated more so than the rest of the colon. So that's really the result. That's usually where most of the perforations come from. You also have patients can have stuff like diverticulitis. With diverticulitis, you already have micro perforations. When you stick a scope in, you're going to have a hole that's now bigger because you're blowing air through it. And the third reason really is multiple abdominal surgeries. If you see patients that have had multiple abdominal surgeries, they're gonna have adhesions. Your colon is fixed on the right and left side. It's floppy on the transverse and the sigmoid is floppy. But if you have a lot of adhesions, all of those organs become fixed. So anytime you're navigating a scope through it and you're having to go round a, cir round a, cir a squiggle kind of thing up, over, down, if it's fixed and doesn't flux with the scope, you're more likely to have a perforation. So patients with multiple adhesions, older patients that have thin um, colons, they can have a perforation a lot easier versus an EGD, smaller scope. Even if you've had multiple abdominal surgeries, most people don't have upper abdominal adhesions that fix the stomach. And realistically, the esophagus is already fixed, the stomach is somewhat fixed, and the duodenum is fixed to a certain extent, so you're less likely to have that problem even if you did have adhesion. Okay, back. Now, as far as screening, again, colorectal cancer. Who is it? Uh, Rohit. Who? Rohit. Oh, hello? Hey, what's up? All right, back to our regular scheduled program. So, screening. With regard to screening, 45. If you have a family history of ulcerative colitis or Crohn's disease and type of inflammatory bowel disease, it's a good screening test for that, especially if you have abdominal pain. Anal cancer, it is part of the workup, but an anal cancer usually can be seen just on physical exam. Because of where it is, you also may have recurrence or disease inside the rectum, so we use it as part of that as well. But again, an anal cancer and a colorectal cancer are a little different because they're treated differently. Because of the length, again, bigger, bigger, flex sig. A flex sig is actually only looking at your sigmoid colon. So from here down. This is more of historical importance because the majority of cancers that people have occur from the anus all the way up to the sigmoid colon. When we didn't have good scopes, a flex sig in combination with a barium enema, which is a radiographical test that cleared the rest of the colon, was pretty much how we did it. The nice part about a flex sig is you don't have to do a prep. The nice part about a flex sig is you don't have to do a prep. You can just do a enema. And I said it twice because the worst part about a colonoscope versus an EGD is a colonoscopy, you have to have a prep. For the EGD, there is no prep, so you can get it done, move. For a colonoscope, you have to have a prep. Flex sig, no prep, you just had to do two enemas, one the night before and one the morning of the procedure and you're done. So a lot of people like that, but again, it only looks at your sigmoid and your rectum. The rest of this has to be interpreted as a, another way. It used to be done by something called a um, guaiac positive. Now it's got a different name, but it looked for bleeding. We have a new thing called Cologuard. Cologuard is a good test to look for hyperplastic polyps. Excuse me. Cologuard is a good test to look for dysplastic polyps. It looks for dysplasia. Um, by looking at some of the cells that are shed from a dysplastic lesion. What that means is it's going to tell you if you have a 
Tubular villus adenoma with high grade dysplasia or low grade dysplasia. That's cool, but it does not tell you if you have a large adenoma. The whole goal of getting a polyp out early is to look and get it before it grows. The amount of time that it takes for a colon polyp to go from a polyp to cancer is about 10 years. The nice part about doing a colonoscope is if you find a polyp, you can remove it ahead of time before it turns this plastic, before it requires surgery because it's now a cancer. The Cologuard is a good test, but again, it doesn't tell us if you have an adenoma that is not this plastic yet. So we typically don't use that as our only modality. If you have someone that doesn't want to get a colonoscopy every five or 10 years, or someone that is too old to tolerate uh, anesthesia, or someone that has a very thin colon that has had multiple operations, and you think that perforation rate is going to be a lot higher, then using Cologuard to screen them is good. If you have someone that has a family history of cancer in their colon, and you're getting screening colonoscopies every five years or 10 years, and you want to do something a little more in that situation, a Cologuard is a good test because it will tell us whether or not that person has dysplasia, but it's also used in a situation where you've probably had a screening colonoscopy. Again, those recommendations have changed recently, but generally that's how they're used. The last thing is CT colonoscopy. CT colonoscopy, it was the rage probably about 10 years ago. Oh, you don't have to have a prep. Oh, you can just go and get it done. Oh, you don't have to worry about the perforation rate. Problem with it is one, it only looks at large polyps. Two, if you don't do a prep for it, it looks like stool. So the problem with that is they initially say you don't have to do a prep, then they changed it. Oh, okay, now you have to do a prep. So a lot of people were like, well, the prep was the worst part. So if I'm doing the prep, why am I not just doing the colonoscopy. So if you find a large polyp, you can just take it out with a colonoscopy versus a CT scan. You just say, oh, I think I see something. So it's now fallen to more of a screening test. If you have somebody that you're worried about something and you were doing repeat colonoscopies, but you're worried that you might perforate because they've had a perforation in the past and they're scared or the GI or the surgeon is scared, um, CT colonoscopy may be a good additional test. Not the only test, but additional test. That pretty much covers the difference between an EGD and a colonoscopy. Um, again, colorectal surgeons do this. General surgeons do this. GI surgeons do this. Um, some small towns, your family doctor or your interns are doing EGDs, colonoscopies, and flexes. It's a procedure that you can be taught once you're taught how to do it, you can do it relatively safely. Um, and it's a good thing if you have anemia, GI bleeding, or you're doing screening for one of these other problems. Uh, hopefully this gives you a lot of good information and you now know the difference. Again, if you have any questions, put them in the comments below. DM me, look us up on Instagram. If you look on the channel, there are probably a few videos of me doing EGDs, colonoscopies, or the results. Hope this kind of tells you what you wanted to know. All right, guys, take care. Thank you.